As many of you know, this uh, uh, symposium uh, is funded by the Alliance to Advance Liberal Arts Colleges, which is a national organization of uh, the leading liberal arts colleges that funds uh, uh, um, a number of symposium, conference, workshop grants every year. Uh, they uh, are meant to bring together the faculty from uh, liberal arts colleges in this country. And uh, the terms of these grants are such that uh, we're encouraged to address the issues of pedagogy in these workshops. We sort of we come together to talk about teaching methods and pedagogy. And some of us are more enthusiastic about pedagogy and talking about <laughs> pedagogy than others are. Uh, I belong to the camp of people who are less interested in, <laughs> in, in explicit, uh, explicit discussions of uh, pedagogy. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's not like that. Like, it's not that I tricked the deans of the uh, um, uh, this consortium into <coughs> giving us a grant in order to get together and discuss pedagogy, but then not doing pedagogy at all. No, Did I was you, I, no, you, no, no, I didn't. Give I, I, I was very, I was very <laughs> open about what uh, we would like to do here to have a public symposium. Uh, for faculty and students and colleagues from other uh, uh, colleges and universities uh, to discuss um, Putinism as a phenomenon that has relevance for our teaching practices. Uh, 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 teaching, by teaching I mean teaching various subjects. I mean teaching Russian language, teaching Russian literature, uh, teaching sociology, teaching political science, teaching history, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the deans of the consortium uh, thought it was a reasonable plan. Uh, but uh, to conclude this um, uh, ostensibly pedagogy uh, uh, involving enterprise, I thought it was uh, fair to actually have a rather short panel discussing the questions of pedagogy of, 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 so of, of, yeah. of pedagogy ex expli <coughs> uh, explicitly. But uh, I want to add something else to this. Is this. I, I came to read 15 years ago, 16 years ago, and my first maybe like eight to ten years here, I, I regularly taught courses on contemporary Russian literature, society, and culture. And they were great fun, and they were very enlightening, and they, I was very enthusiastic about doing this. And then at some point, I kind of lost interest in doing this. And I feel sort of speechless when I have to address the socio-political, cultural reality of today's Russia. Uh, and in a way, kind of the lyrical impulse uh, uh, behind organizing the symposium was my own speechlessness, uh, my own inability to find a way to uh, integrate contemporary cultural material in my teaching repertory. With that, uh, I, uh, I, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I thought that our conversation, discussions, and talks today were extremely uh, productive and useful and helpful in the way of possibly uh, helping me and other faculty members who, like me, are uh, having problems with integrating contemporary material in teaching. But as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, when, you, when you're a Russian professor, you can always go to uh, Pushkin, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, you know, Eisenstein, uh, Soviet classics, and uh, just disregard, ignore you know, Putinist culture. But that's not necessarily very fair to our students who, are, uh, who may be interested in what's going on in today's Russia. Also, the issues having to do with contemporary socio-political cultural climate in Russia keep uh, uh, popping up even in the language classes. 
like there are things that you have to address somehow. Anyways, let me introduce the members of this panel, our distinguished uh, colleagues from Pomona College, Professor Ann Dwyer, Amherst College, uh, Professor Kathy Cipella, and Williams College, Professor Beck Aliyev. And uh, in preparation for this uh, panel, I asked them to kind of uh, think about a few questions. First question which I uh, presented them with is uh, kind of for starters in our discussion, maybe to share and briefly discuss the relevant current syllabi, which uh, include contemporary cultural materials. I asked them, how would you characterize your approach to the selection of texts and materials? Which texts have triggered most productive discussions? Which ones have led to dead ends in the classroom? My second question uh, had to do with the ways to productively integrate non-artistic, especially social scientific texts in the course on contemporary Russian culture. And actually I think that today we had so much uh, excellent uh, uh, input uh, uh, of social scientists, and yesterday, and yesterday, of social scientists, which will clearly enrich our teaching of uh, cultural texts. Uh, my next question uh, had to do with the current kind of political climate in which we operate. Uh, and I said, uh, as the relations between the West and Russia are confrontational again, how does one avoid or deconstruct propagandistic cliches and political cultural stereotypes? And my last question was, uh, how do we approach the anti-liberal trend in contemporary Russian culture without scaring our students away yeah. from the Russian studies. <laughs> and with that, I open the floor for the panelists. So who, who would like does to the order first? matter? Well, so I have my PowerPoint. I, do you want us to kind of do a dialogue thing? Uh, no, I, let, let's begin with like short little uh, uh, remarks by you, and then we will engage in dialogue. Back, do I want to begin? Sure. <coughs> so, uh, I'd like to tell you a bit about my course that I teach at Williams College. It's called, um, it's called Contemporary Russian Culture and Politics. And it's a hybrid course an experiment for me, it's the first time I teach this. Uh, it's a course that combines reading literature and uh, watching films with analytical materials. So materials from social sciences, political science, sociology, and we read these texts side by side to kind of mutually inform them. And so one thing that's very important is context. We are really here after the context to kind of look closely into the background, the social background, which sometimes is openly, explicitly referenced in the works we read, but sometimes it's not so explicit, and yet we kind of go beyond it and we try to situate it in that uh, political, social uh, context. And as we do this, it emerges that uh, novels uh, become forms of inquiry and forms of critique and criticism, social and political criticism. So while the course does not really engage that interesting body of theory that does talk about artistic works as indeed being uh, works of social criticism, we focus on more immediate uh, reading, more immediate uh, discussion of the tendencies in Russia since uh, 1991, that is since the breakup of the USSR. And uh, these are the texts, the artistic texts that we cover in this course. Uh, there are four novels, one short story, and a uh, few films. So um, the selection is perhaps fairly familiar to many of you, uh, but I'll quickly mention, just in case, uh, Victor Pelerin, Homo Zapiens, also known as Generation Z. This is probably, in my opinion, a cultural encyclopedia of the wild 90s. In there you have references to so many political figures, you know, Yeltsin, Dirizovsky, and you name it, all these social calamities and processes and the crisis that this decade is marked with. 
Andrei Kulkov uh, is a Ukrainian Russia who, who is a Russophone. Uh, his novel, Death and the Penguin, is set in Kiev, and yet you could easily transpose this onto the Russian reality. And in fact, for the purposes of this course, it's not so much Russia that is the focus, but rather that loser post-Soviet space, which is focused in Russia, but some of the same trends can be observed in the neighboring countries. Uh, Vladimir Sorokin, so these two novels I've named are covering the 90s, and then with Sorokin we move on to uh, Putin's era, uh, since 2000. Uh, Day of the Prishnik, uh, by many, can be seen as a work of satire, and uh, it can be read that way, uh, but we also look at it as, a, as an example of the workings of the power ministries and uh, the, the vertical power in its very grotesque way that it is presented in the novel. The Heart We Live in Science is probably the thickest novel that we read. Um, it is uh, loosely modeled after the activities of National Bolshevik Party in Russia, which is currently banned. And uh, it is very transparently referencing many uh, real-life characters in Russian politics. So this particular novel is interesting because it uh, touches upon the themes of civil society, because it's about an activist who is actively taking part in various street protests, and there is police brutality. Um, and of course, it also raises the question of political party formation in Russia. You know, why is it that parties don't work? And what is non-systemic opposition? Well, where are they driven? Uh, I also touch upon the theme of federalism with the situation in Chechnya. And I go back to the first uh, Chechen campaign with the short story by Makani, Prisoner of the Caucasus. Um, and then the films also tag along there. They kind of touch upon the same things that I have just mentioned the, in connection with the novels. Bimmer uh, for the 90s, Leviathan for the more recent uh, Putin's period, and then The Prisoner of the Mountains uh, again for the Chechen. Uh, let me also give you an idea about the theoretical works that we read. Um, Stephen White's understanding Russian politics, in my understanding, is one of the standard texts used in theory uh, courses uh, of interest to Russian politics. And I personally find it very useful because it's very well, uh, uh, very rich. There's a wealth of information, lots of details, and yet it is given in a very almost entertaining fashion. That's very easily laid out. So while there is some explanation of the uh, more technical political processes such as the, you know, the face-off between Yeltsin and the uh, parliament in 1993, the constitutional amendments, the presidential powers, there is also a lot of attention paid to the down-to-earth daily life of Russians and how they felt about living in the 90s or how they, like Putin, actually heard some of that uh, discussion of uh, Putin uh, earlier in the day. So all of that is in this book, so for that purpose it uh, has been very useful. Uh, I will note here that we don't necessarily read all of them, but we do read about 50 to 80 percent uh, of each one of these uh, books. Uh, on the whole, the books that I find to be most productive for the purposes of this kind of a course, which is not geared toward any single discipline, even though this of course, is cross-listed with political science department and our own Russian studies in addition to global studies and comparative literature. Uh, the works that yield themselves well for this kind of diverse uh, crowd and multiple objectives are the ones that are interdisciplinary and the ones that are not steeply immersed in any technical, narrowly defined, discipline-specific uh, theoretical basis. And so we've had lots of fun in our class uh, working with the book by Lenin Volkov, Violent Entrepreneurs. Uh, tellingly, this book was voted in Russia as the most popular academic read for the general audience. Uh, I would say this is the academic equivalent of a crime novel. <laughs> it tells the story of racketeering gangs and how they emerged in the post-Soviet period, you know, from being racket uh, little groups into fully-fledged legal protection companies and eventually, you know, going 
higher up above into the power ministries, into the uh, militia and police and ministry of internal affairs. So it's a very readable, very accessible, yet very informative uh, research. Alona Lidinova study on informal practices in daily life and in politics in business is another example of a very highly suitable book for this purposes. What I like about these books, and the reason I chose them, is that they kind of draw a very wide arch. They touch upon politics, but also daily life, daily practice. And of course, with Lidinova and the informal practices that she discusses, there are very clear uh, trajectories back into the Soviet past, and uh, those practices continue, even though they evolved somewhat. Uh, Brian Taylor's study on power ministries uh, is probably the more narrow and specific one, yet it was very useful also, because uh, one of the central themes, given the selection of the novels, which in itself was partly determined by what's available in English, so one of the central themes has been the role of the coercive capacity of the state and the privatization of that capacity. And uh, Brian Taylor in his book uh, very well describes the, the hardships and perils of working uh, in power ministries, in the Ministry of Defense, in Internal Affairs, and various other directorates, such as the Federal Security Service, uh, from you know, problems in recruitment and retention, training, professionalism, all of which open up a very bright ground for corruption and uh, infiltration or exchanges, conflation with uh, what would be called criminal structures. And as we uh, build into this course, uh, this is the first semester I'm teaching, it, many things emerge which uh, I did not necessarily plan for, but uh, my students keep telling me about this and I sort of collect them. So one thing that has been uh, popping up often is uh, that students are surprised how that line between the law and crime is so blurry. And it gives an eerie feeling, just like with the novel Death and the Penguin, which is very surreal. Uh, let me give you a snapshot of our reading schedule so that you see exactly how we juxtapose the artistic and theoretical text. So, say when we are reading Kalevis Homo Zafians, uh, and we get to the two chapters that have scenes of uh, racketeers coming, you know, in one scene is a Chechen, and another is a nationalist Russian, and they kind of fight off, fight it off uh, amongst themselves. And uh, lots of rhetoric is used in, the, in between, such as Krusha, Rubin, Strelka. Uh, Nayez. And by the way, these terms are not always easily translatable into English because, as Volkov described in his study, this has a you know large connotation on its own within those uh, struggles between uh, organized criminal, semi-criminal, and police groups. And so, incidentally, looking into the context also brings us back to the texture of the text to talk about translation, to talk about what's lost, to talk about uh, the specific words and their meaning. So it enriches the meaning in that way. As one of my students have said, uh, after watching, uh, after reading Volkov and then seeing film Dimmer, which illustrates those bracketeering processes, she said I could watch this film on a different level. And so to me, that was uh, you know, pleasant to my ears because that's actually an objective uh, of such a course to, to kind of raise the notch of reading, close reading, but not in terms of just paying attention to the structure, but also looking into the details and the context and bringing it to the foreground. Uh, so to continue my example with the Lenin's novel, uh, there is yet another section on um, the workings of uh, the media. Uh, in particular, uh, the main character, Tarski, becomes a copywriter and he is assigned to the so-called dirt squad. His job is to find uh, compromising materials and, and to run uh, black PR campaigns. And these terms, in fact, are used throughout the novel, black PR, uh, compromise, and so I've used the two chapters, the relevant chapters from the Dinova study, that are specifically devoted to these topics where she contextualizes it in its own history and its own necessity and, and function within Russian politics. 
Uh, <clears throat> so, in addition to the <coughs> books that I have mentioned, there is also a wide selection of articles, book chapters and journal articles, and here is another example. Uh, the novel Homo Zappians is mostly about the workings of the media, and so this is kind of a running theme. And uh, towards the end, I have my students read these three uh, articles. One is about political capitalism and the Russian media, which I think found very useful. It talks about the necessity of controlling the media in an environment of political capitalism, where private property is in fact determined by your political conditions. So going back to the idea of roof on a, in a different context. And by the way, roof or krisha is having someone higher up who protects your business and your interests. Um, so Stephen White, again, in different forms. Uh, this is his article studying the uh, elections that brought Putin to power in 2000. And he specifically discusses the role of the media and how those uh, the media coverage has been heavily uh, dominated by Putin's presence in violation of the uh, legal rules that were in place, normative rules that were in place. Uh, Andrew Wilson's book is entirely dedicated to the topic of uh, mediatization of politics in the post-Soviet space and how political parties are not necessarily uh, grassroots parties or you know, parties made up of real existing entities, but rather broadcast parties. They're created on the eve of elections and they primarily exist on the airwaves. So here is a social scientific illustration of what we see in the novel as a postmodern simulacrum. Of course, in the, in the novel, it's given in a grotesque way, but we kind of look at the more uh, scholarly reality behind it. Uh, so when it comes to evaluation, of course, there's the class uh, discussion. This is a fairly small group, uh, about 10 students. Uh, uh, they write two essays, one midterm, shorter one, and one is expected at the end. The essays are on the literary uh, texts, but uh, I also asked them to give oral presentations, and they're about to begin them uh, next week. Uh, I had given them this selection. Again, this selection was determined by the novels that we read, because uh, the power ministries feature prominently there. We do have the heads of uh, defense minister, ministry, interior ministry, and FSB, the security service. Uh, because of the novel Sankhya and the uh, political parties, I have also assigned some of the longest running political figures from the world of the parliament and party politics. Uh, and then the final batch of four people there are a mixed uh, bag of things depending on the interests of people. And uh, of course, you know, Kandidov is also related to the Chechen thing that I had mentioned. And we can also open up the topic of. Uh, uh, opposition with Navalny and uh, other topics as well. So this is uh, very roughly, very briefly, the structure and the idea for the design of the course. Uh, as I was designing it, I couldn't find other courses or syllabi for, like this, and so I kind of asked you, using this opportunity, if you're aware of a course like this, please let me know, because I'd be happy to uh, talk to someone uh, about their methodologies, the, their way of achieving this kind of symbiosis. And thank you. Well, I have a question. Do you go chronologically? Do you go with the uh, Prison of the Mountains and then to the, the 2000s and then to the 2010s? It's chronological in some ways. Overall, yes, we go from the 90s to the uh, Putin's period. But with the Chechen theme, um, I kind of say it toward the end. Uh -huh. Yes. So we go back, but that is also meaningful in the sense that the events of the 90s set the frame for understanding, you know, the way federalism works itself <laughs> currently nowadays. Yes. So yes and no, depending on the specific topic. Thank you very much. We will have time for, for, for collective discussion a little later. Uh, Kathy? Okay. Um, I just, uh, I, I should say, at the outset, I do not teach a course on Putinism. Um, but I, um, I found it necessary to include a s substantial 
section on Putinism in my course, my survey course on 20th and 21st century literature and film, which I reconceived conceptually as a course on catastrophe, um, beginning with the Bolshevik Revolution as catastrophe, and then grouping the texts that I read in the course, again, mainly film and lit, but also diaries and documents um, around particular catastrophic episodes, um, purges, World War II, and then ultimately, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. I agree with Putin, <laughs> it was a great catastrophe. Um, so I just found, uh, because of that, the way in which I had reconceptualized the survey, I found that I had to teach Putinism. And so um, I reached for, for that final section of the course, which frankly I haven't taught yet, I'm just entering upon it. I reached for a book that I really admire by a, uh, an anthropologist. So this is by way of addressing this question of incorporating other kinds of materials than just the primary materials. And I teach on the syllabus even, there I make a distinction between primary materials and secondary materials. So I teach that whole problem of the relationship between the two kinds of texts, critical discourse and primary um, documents. So this would be, I, I would say, my most important secondary um, material for the Putin section of the course. It's a book by uh, Sergei Ushakin, as some of you probably know. It's called The Patriotism of Despair, Nation, War, and Loss in Russia. And the reason I really like this book is because it gives you a way of thinking about what, I mean, I, in an un uninformed way, seems to me the main issue of the Putin era, which is the apparent mass support for Putin, um, which um, one can characterize as a resurgence of a kind of great Russian nationalism. So the problem of nationalism and the, the particular character of nationalism in this period. And uh, Ushakin really helps me think about it, and I'm actually having students read portions of this book. Uh, has anyone read this? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in this book, Ushakin um, documents how um, Soviet citizens mourned the loss of the Soviet world by creating their own symbolizations of connectedness, looking for a different way to think about how they're connected as a people now that the Soviet Union no longer exists. And the he finds that the vocabulary they use was mainly a vocabulary of kinship and ethnicity. Um, and mainly through, he argues, rituals of mourning. Um, he talks about um, the ways in, in which um, mothers, for example, mourn sons killed uh, in the Afghan and Chechen wars. Um, and this is, uh, this is a quotation from the book. What is crucial in the cases described here is that the feeling of loss the emotional memory of experienced or imagined injury was not a result of withdrawal into one's private life, but was translated into ideas of national belonging. Stories about the nation and the country were used as a major organizing plot for individual accounts. So in the course, I sort of contrasted this to, you know, in American culture, when people talk about trauma, it's in the mode of the, you know, the individual, going on Oprah, but, you know, kind of crude compare and contrast, but by way of emphasizing what uh, Ushakin has, has d documented here, which is a, a way of coping with trauma that translates into or lends itself to an, a resurgence of nationalism and support for, um, maybe, <laughs> support for Putin. Um, uh, it's also interesting for me to use this at this point in the course because I have actually used earlier texts that deal with trauma. I mean, hoary old classics like, I can't believe I used that phrase, Rachmatova. But um, <laughs> for um, Requiem, reading Requiem. Obviously, I'm not going to teach a survey without teaching Requiem. 
But the interesting, you know, problem of Requiem, then obviously the individual account merged successfully or not with an account of a collective experience. So it's a it's a gesture made in Russian um, culture from all kinds of parties, right? Dissidents to others. So it's a very strong impulse. And what I like about Ushakin's analysis is that he describes how it's working in this particular period of um, post, this post-Soviet period. Um, another reason I like it is because I'm putting it next to this extraordinary book that I've only just read, and I'm really glad to be teaching, which is Svetlana Alexeyevich's Voices from Chernobyl. Boy, talk about trigger warnings. Um, this is an incredibly <laughs> powerful book. Have, how many people have read it already? Yeah. Okay, so you know who she is, right? And you know what this project is. She just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, which was controversial because what she does actually is collate and um, reshape at levels that's not, not entirely, in ways that are not entirely clear, um, uh, testimonials from survivors. And she's got a couple of these books. One focuses on um, soldiers coming back from... Afghanistan, um, this particular book obviously is about the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and it's such interesting material to read next to an anthropologist's reading of this kind of material because you just get to hear the voices. Again, manipulated slightly, apparently, by Alexeyevich. Um, but you, what you get to do is watch people symbolize their experience or watch them attempt to symbolize their experience. Um, the way that Alexeyevich describes her project, and this is, these are pages that are included in this edition, and this makes me think of your remarks, um, Marsha, and also the city gaze. I've often thought that the simple fact, the mechanical fact, is no closer to the truth than a vague feeling, rumor, vision. Why repeat the fact? They cover up our feelings. The development of these feelings, the spilling of these feelings past the facts is what fascinates me. I try to find them, collect them, protect them. These people had already seen what for everyone else is still unknown. I felt like I was recording the future. So here's someone who is using finding material um, and addressing two problems at the same time. One is the dubious facticity of anything in the post-Soviet era. And the other is this matter of how do you face the future. What is it that she imagines in these voices that may, might allow, and, and it's a little bit complicated here, of course, by the fact that this episode occurs in Belarus and Ukraine. I mean, those are the populaces that it affects. But she doesn't emphasize that in this account. She really brings together a lot of different voices, and many of them are Russian, because many of the liquidators, the people who were sent in to handle the problem, were Russian. So there's no, at least to my ear, there's no sense of national difference uh, um, here. Uh, it's not central here. And also class difference. I mean, there are very different, you know, there's the technical elite, um, technical intelligentsia, but there are also the you know, simplest local people. Um, it's, um, uh, what I, um, well, one of, the, one of the themes that emerges and which also makes it so useful for a course that's trying to take in the long picture of the 20th century and the 21st century, is that the, the survivors themselves, the participants themselves, compare it to these classic Soviet traumas. They say, oh, it was just like 37. Oh, the, most often they say it was just like World War II. It was a war. Someone even says, a few people say, oh, it was just like the blockade. Mm -hmm. um, so they are reaching, that's the way they think about it. And yet, there seems still to be a crisis. They reach for those discourses, those Soviet-era discourses of heroism, 
um, and find that they're no longer usable, which is so interesting. Um, the one here, here's one voice, um, and, and, and by, by reading this, I mean to suggest that perhaps there are other operations, other kinds of symbolization that go on besides the patriotism of despair. That is, I think it's interesting to show the students that there are different ways in which um, one can symbolize trauma that could play out politically differently, ideally, possibly, in the future. Um, so just a few quotations before I finish. Um, there's a good joke. The nuclear half-life of a Kiev cake is 36 hours. And for me, it took me three years. So he's saying, this is my half-life. Three years later, I turned in my party card, my little red book. I became free in the zone. Chernobyl blew my mind. It set me free. Another voice, uh, and this, this to me is incredibly moving, um, late in the book, if you'll indulge me um, just for a few more minutes. I was an engineer at the Himvolokno, sorry about the stress, I don't know where it belongs, uh, factory. There was a group of East German specialists there at the time putting in new equipment. I saw how other people from another culture behaved. When they learned about the accident, and by the way, we all know, of course, that they didn't tell anybody about the danger. The book opens with the wife of one of the liquidators who was sent in in his standard fireman's equipment and died within two weeks. It is the most devastating part of the book because she stays with him as his body morphs into a monstrosity. Zero protection on the roof of a nuclear reactor. So this is the broad experience that people are documenting, is absolute betrayal on the part of the state. Right? How do you symbolize that? Um, uh, so back to this person. Um, when the Germans learned about the accident, they immediately demanded medical attention, decimeters, and a controlled food supply. They listened to German radio and knew what to do. Of course, they were denied all their requests. So they immediately packed their bags and got ready to leave. Buy us tickets, send us home. If you can't keep us safe, we're leaving. So what do the Russians do? They make fun of the Germans. They're hysterical. They're cowards. They're measuring radiation in the borscht. <laughs> what a joke. Now our men, our men, they're real men, real Russian men, desperate men, a giant men, right? They're fighting the reactor. They're not worried about their lives. They got up on that melting roof with their bare hands in their canvas gloves. And our kids go with their flags to the demonstrations. But then this guy says, um, that's a form of barbarism, the absence of fear for oneself. We always say we and never I. We'll show them Soviet heroism. We'll show them what the Soviet character is made of. We'll show the whole world. But this is me. This is I. I don't want to die. I am afraid. And so he, was, he goes on to say, we're beginning to learn to say I. I don't want to die. I'm afraid. And that seems like such a powerful um, thing to come out of this experience of betrayal and abandonment by the state. And this, of course, could translate into something like what Olga was describing, a kind of um, self-help ethos or you know, a libertarian ethos. But it also could be a lesson from the Germans. It's like, wait a minute, you need to take care of us. It could be a different view of the state. Um, so, and, and this is to, I, I hope, Jane, also goes to your question about how do you teach illiberal, how, how, how do you teach Americans about this populace that seems to be so illiberal. Finding for me texts that open up possibilities. Like, well, these are you know people who are struggling with a traumatic experience and trying to find the um, solutions to it. That, that it's still an open question, right? That um, that, that the kind the ways in which you could work out a traumatic experience could be various. And, um, and you can find analogies. Like, for example, it occurred, it occurred to me to talk about the Flint water business. 
abandon a man, abandonment by a state that is supposed to be uh, protecting you, right? Um, so finding analogies, keeping a sense of an you know open culture, um, is a way in which I try to draw, make make this material less alien and and scary, you know. Um, and I've, I'm just very struck by the, I, as you have been, Jenny, by the focus on the 90s as a place, an era that was felt like it was more in flux where, where these kinds of, you know, things could play out differently if you go back to that moment where you, you have to figure something out, right? Um, so that it isn't all, doesn't look like it's all being figured out in the fashion that, um, that uh, Oshakian documents in his book. Terrific, thank you. My turn? So I, I'll, I'll also begin with saying I don't actually teach post-Soviet stuff, or Putinism. I mean, I do teach post-Soviet things, but I don't teach Putinism. But what I do teach, and I think both of your classes are courses in English, correct? Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about an advanced Russian class but advanced here, as I think probably a lot of the faculty in the room know, can mean just got through two years of Russian and can barely understand anything, or coming back from Russia and have a great mastery of Prichasti, Dea Prichasti, and understand absolutely everything that's said on the news. And I think in terms of cultural and context, it's very similar. I might have a heritage speaker who knows absolutely nothing about Russia but speaks the language. And again, I might have the people who just came back from Bad Smolny and just took a class on Russian history and one on Russian politics. So we have this amazingly varied language competency. And I think we cannot underestimate how little Americans know about Russia. And so I'm working with these two givens, and I teach a course on everyday life in the Soviet Union. Um, and I'm teaching it now for the second time. The first time I taught it was about four years ago, and I really didn't reach into the Putin era as much. Um, this time, I'm doing it quite a bit. Uh, and so one of my main linguistic goals is for them to be able to understand spoken and written text in a wide range of genres, and we talk about genre and about rhetorical strategies and things like that. And we loosely go through the tw Soviet 20th century, uh, and I pick a topic, sort of an object, for each period. And then we also read, this is a new thing, I, we're reading Anya von Bremsen's memoir about Soviet cooking because mm. it's, it raises questions of everyday life and she manages <clears throat> to invent or have family members who seem to be involved in absolutely everything that happened. <laughs> um, so we also talk about the emigre's position, what, what she's writing from and what kind of nostalgic vis vision we're getting here. Uh, and we read some basic sort of Russian essays, just, just context, like what was NEP kind of texts, right? And so I'm going to talk about three topics I have. And the move that happens, which I present some kind of original primary document and a little bit of context, and then I send the students out to find ways in which this reaches into sort of public discourse today. So the first topic is Kamunana Kvartira. And I, this is how I started the whole class because there's that great website put together by Colgate, Utyakh Utyokhin, and um, Paperna, Slava Paperna put together great websites that's in English and in Russian interviews with Zhilci Kommunalne Kvartiri Shistom Gadu. And lots of cultural materials. So we work with that a little bit. We work on, on, on audio, on comprehension. And then I stage, and their first reaction is, oh my god, this place is a dump. How can people live here? And there's this sort of self-exoticizing that happens in the videos. And then I stage um, a debate. And it's actually, this is one of the most successful moments in the class. I don't know. I'm not one of those people who stages debates, but in language classes, it seems to work. And it's raselitsa ili ni raselitsa. I come in as... I know, probably if I were actually in Agenpanedvizhmasti, I would not meet with them as a group. It would be individual conversations behind closed doors. But we change that. We meet as a group. And they have to take a stand on whether they're actually going to be bought out of the communal apartment or not and why. And suddenly, everyone wants, almost everyone wants to stay. <laughs> and so for me, this is actually a really interesting moment of 
oh my God, this is a dump. Why would anyone live here? What happened? These poor Soviets, their lives were awful. Because that's, of course, what we've grown up with. Putin is awful. Putin is a liberal. The Soviet Union was awful. The Soviet Union is a liberal. Everyday life sucked. And so my job, I think, in some ways I'm pushing against the trauma narratives and this and that, is my job is I think that every day, at moments, it was extremely difficult. There's no way to say 1937 was a good year for everyday life. Or the blockade, which is another topic. And yet people lived and did things and made sense of their lives in particular kinds of ways. And so when we have this, and then the next thing I did just this year, there's always going to be something that just came up in the news this year. Um, Sarah, whose last name I forget, at Tulane, puts together a website with some news that's worked up again for Russian language learners. And she had put up some Deutsch videos about um, people who were protesting because they had taken out mortgages in Euro euros or dollars and are now being defaulted on, basically, right? And they're having to pay these back and they can't pay them back. And so for the more advanced students in the class, they present to us these interviews and talk about the problems. And it becomes then I present a little mini lecture in Russian with vocabulary presented for them, it, which Kostya helped me with, about exactly what we know about privatization and how, how that happened in the transition and sort of where people may be landing now and what the transition from a socialist economy to a capitalist economy means in terms of everyday life and housing. And so this is maybe two weeks of work. But we've gone from, on the one hand, this has been an introduction to the 1920s. We read some Trotsky. We learned about Buit. We did just mm. tiny, tiny, tiny bits of theory of everyday life. I mean paragraphs, because we can't read a lot in this class. Um, but then we jump into this. We, we managed to make it all the way to Putin. And we do this again and again and again. Um, so very quickly, then another topic is the building of the metro in Moscow. Right? So you get the Stalinist production, mm -hmm. Straitistva narrative. We read then their main Russian text that I provide for them is actually Pelivin. Podziemnaya Nyaba. It's a little tiny essay he writes about how it's really a chram. And then he gets to the myths about krysy, katare jevutam, like that, you know, oversized and people who disappear in the metro. So suddenly you have in about three pages an entire mythology of the Moscow metro presented. And then their assignment on top of the discussion of this, where we also talk about Prichastia, mind you, right? Um, we get into, I basically say, OK, go search the Russian internet, find some sort of representation of what the metro means to people today, and bring it in and present it orally in Russian. Um, I got someone found the Chitayashi Moskva Vagolny. And I was like, oh, wow, I wish culture were valued so highly in America that we actually had Karnei Chukovsky, which we had, of course, read in Russian two or three or something, where we had Karnei Kuchovsky on the wall. And then we talk about, well, what kind of culture is actually being represented in this? You know, um, We have someone finds a pop concert in a metro, very official, but in a metro car. And oh, my god, a pop, pop star in the metro. And another person found an advertisement for some energy drink that had people dressed up as penguins riding the metro. <laughs> And so suddenly we go from you can't take photographs in the metro to penguins advertising in the metro. And I think we're entering this realm of this postmodern mm. Putinism and these sites that had these certain kinds of heroic valences being occupied by kind of official culture. And then I brought in for them because they hadn't found it, the Vaina Pir piece, you know, the, 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 the wake for Prigov. Um, as a kind of unofficial appropriation of the metro car space, which contrasted with the officially permitted pop concert in the metro car. So these are the kinds of dynamics um, that we look at. You know, then we also do um, the blockade. And I didn't know about the Dost incident, so that I'm going to bring that into my students. But I think what also happens is that there are these moments of these, these events that one finds out by accident. It's very hard to have this codified what is Putinism now because it's changing every day. And it seems to be in a very eclectic, very fragmented space of inf informational space. Like I heard about the one thing. Um, I heard about and I taught the fact that there, was, there were advertisements for the new Dietsky Mir, Lubish Rebyonko, Advidina Lubyanko. And we talked about why that was problematic. 
but also how this Stalinist sort of very sort of funny, happy, creepy Stalinist vision is, you know, what in German you would say salonfähig, that you can actually bring it into polite discussion. Um, and so I think what I'm trying to teach them to do is, and I also, again, one last bit, is that I also try to have them find analogies. So when we talk about communal apartments, we also talk about the fact of a prapisco, which, like, what? what's a prapisco? What do you mean you can't live wherever you want to live, right? And then I go, okay, United States history. Have you heard of Jim Crow? Can everyone afford to live in San Francisco today? So we think a little bit about these, the, the, the borders and the, 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 the limits of our own sort of liberal, you can do whatever you want, individualist um, American ideology. Um, and I had other examples, but I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Anna. Let me open the floor for your questions and remarks and uh, free will in discussion. How many people are in the question? Neil, please. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's easy, it's six. <laughs> Neil. No. Well, I that is not how I've ever framed it. What I teach, what I try to teach in terms of both visual and linguistic production, I try to teach them to identify certain kinds of cliches. So we talk about, like, I actually give them a little tiny bit of Selishev Yuzik Revolutionne Epochi. When we're talking about Kamunalna Ekvartira, and we talk about various terms like Uplatnenia and this and that, and then like those, I don't know, the, 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 those combined nouns and all of these things, so that they learn that this is something that happened to the language then. And that then when they see certain kinds of cliches, for example, they might be able to identify that. Um, for World War II, we watched the Concert na Krasnaj Ploshidi in 2015, and we just stopped the video at various points. And this comes back to who was talking about the Tsitatnes, but you don't know which, whether it's, that was you, right? The real citation or whether it's a fake citation. And so that's pretty much what we're working on there. Okay, what language, what visual language is being cited right here in the show? What visual language is cited right here in the show? So that they can start, um, start identifying maybe even visual codes more than linguistic ones. Well, I, in my six, I'd say I have one of those, and he's bored. But I also have some who are, you know, low intermediate. Yeah, but, but I have to say that even those who are advanced linguists, that's very high. That means they will face errors and be That's a really good point. But actually, I would say it's a little bit different, is that I, I think we have talked about the fact that what's so interesting about Putin's self-representation in official Russia is that it wears the cool glasses, hmm. right? The pub zizda goes into the metro. Something that was once official and distant has become popular and cool and private and personal life, like this intense personalization that the cool glasses, right? I mean, I think that is something we've talked about. I probably could do more at the language level. Yeah. Any questions and remarks? Alex. Uh, I teach a class of communism class in, in English, in sociology. And um, 
I was wondering whether you, if either of you had considered any of the other disasters or any other kinds of movies. Like, how did you make a choice to feature the particular um, uh, items that ended up in your syllabus? And I'm thinking in terms of Beth, uh, your class, um, I use Putin's Kiss, I think it's called, which is about Nashi, and a lot of the students really, it really opens their eyes. Um, and uh, in terms of the other kind of uh, secondary literature, I mean, there's, there's, there's like a host of different kinds of secondary literature. In terms of the disasters, are there any other disasters that you like have considered to sort of include in your disasters course? Like how many disasters <laughs> 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 it's so hard to choose which one to focus on? Well, no, I, I mean, I didn't find it that difficult. I mean, I guess the, the idea of the course is that the Bolshevik Revolution, and, you know, I, do, I start with, again, a hoary old classic, Al Alexander Bloch. Fantastic, you know, metaphorization of that event. It's like sweeping everything off the earth, this idea of totally, total disappearance, total loss. And then it's filled with, you know, Soviet construction. So you study that allows you to study early Soviet period. But then you see it that clash between reality and construction yielding these problems. So you, the first one, you know, you 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 do the famine. You do collectivization. So you watch Davjenka, but then you read Platonov. So it, it's just pairing. So I mean, basically, Holodomor um, purges. World War collapse. I mean, yeah, there are so many, but but to, in my mind, they're all they're all consequences of this initial disaster. They all flow out of the Soviet experiment in some way. I mean, that's not the exclusive explanation. It's obviously overdetermined, but the idea is that this is an unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, Such. I mean. I think my colleague teaches it as the great utopia, right? right. So you have, I mean... <laughs> That's how we, we have been teaching it. Yes. But I think you have to just teach the tension. Mm -hmm. But it just, it's right, it's the other side. It's like yeah. Different way of marketing. Shall I quickly respond to the question also? So naturally, the documentary is on my list as well, uh, but it's on a recommended one. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was hesitant was because I do find, in some ways, this documentary to be made for the Western audience and to propagate certain stereotypes. So if I were to require it, I would want to do some balancing work. For example, Julie Hammond also wrote mm -hmm. about Nashi, where she emphasizes you know, the, the beneficial parts of it, the service to the community, which, is, which comes free. While well, it may have some other ramifications, but we cannot exclude one from the other. Uh, but speaking of documentaries, uh, one that I do require is My Perestroika. We watch it at the beginning of the course, you know, when we set the scene for the late Soviet period and for the uh, what's coming. I'm ending my course with that one. Soviet ski Yes, I also found, um, particularly when teaching the 90s and getting at um, some of these alternative formations, um, Judy Mom's wonderful film, Bakke uh, Bakke, mm -hmm. which is great, it's very mm -hmm. funny. But I, I, the only, uh, uh, thank you very much, by the way, and Jenna, this was, this was by no means just kind of a superfluous thing. <laughs> very useful. Um, she didn't say it, so, you know. Um, but what I wanted to, to ask is, all, um, each of you kind of touched on this to one degree or another, but I was wondering, um, maybe Anne, this is more directly for you, but like to what extent you all emphasize questions of gender? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how important is it for you to, to include kind of women's experience um, in, in all these episodes? Well, I'll take it first, yes. Im <laughs> important question, I mean, it comes up immediately with what we talk about the phrase Blit Zayel. Um, you know, we look at the Daesh, you know, Daloi Kukhoner, Absu Daesh, Noboi Blit, we're talking about reorganization of the family. Um, we watch Triti Mishanskaya, which is, uh, you know, Romanskov, Pedensov, Romanskovsky's film about a menage a trois, an accidental menage a trois caused by housing shortage, in which 
the woman who may be impregnated by one, maybe by the other, doesn't get her abortion but hops on the train and leaves them both. In fact, another one of my hypothetical writing assignments, which I haven't read yet, was on the midterm, was imagine retelling the story from her perspective after she's arrived somewhere. Where the hell did she go and what happened to her, right? Um, like, so yeah, huge. Yeah, I mean, it's even just sticking with the Alexievich example, she really, you know, the lot, a lot of the voices are women's voices. Alexievich herself, I think, views um, the Soviet system as patriarchal, um, so that's sort of built into what she does. Um, earlier in the course, it's the, you know, it's Akhmatova, and, uh, well, Ginsburg, uh, we read a blockade diary, and she has interesting comments there about gender about how all of a sudden, in the conditions of the blockade, men had to start talking about food and cooking and had to start standing in lines. So in an interesting way, there was a feminization of the male populace during the blockade. So, <clears throat> well, I have heard in the course as well. I didn't put, up the, um, put it up, but yeah, in the 20s section, yeah, the, sure. Um, I did not plan to talk about gender in my course, but the subject does come up. For example, when we discussed Homo sapiens, at the end, when we were, you know, looking at the entire novel, and we're trying to make sense of uh, national identity, a central theme of that novel, it just naturally occurred, based on what has been said before, that just as the national idea, the Russian idea is absent, so is women. You know, it's entirely male world, male dominated. And when women are featured, they're featured in body parts or as sexual objects. And so, which is yeah, a fictional uh, creature. Um, so it comes up, definitely. Uh, and uh, this is an ongoing course. Uh, we're about, what, two thirds through the course, so. Is did you have any women on your list of authors of major texts or films on that syllabus? Uh-uh, yes. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's like, right, but no, I mean, it's also a problem, right? Finding translations in particular as well, I would guess, but I, I don't remember anything. No, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, no, that's not a problem with, like, Petrushevskaya or Lenitskaya. She has yeah. a lot of stuff translated. Yeah. I was... Tolstoy. Yeah. Tolstoy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We we have time for two more questions. President of the Mountains has a has a homosexual yeah. theme, uh, especially the text, perhaps more than the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe the but is that is like the Zhensky but is missing from your syllabus. I don't know. In terms of like post Soviet culture. Maybe. Like, There's yeah. so many things that could possibly Oh I know, I know, I know. Who doesn't know that? Any question? Question? Yeah, is, is there a, um, I'm struck by it uh, that uh, uh, especially in, in, in Kathy's account, it begins with focus on trauma and ends uh, with joy and sense of humanity and, uh, um, and pleasure. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Why would that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not well informed enough, but um, I don't know if everyone in the room knows what an amazing poet my, <laughs> we have in the room, Maria Stepanova. And um, in Russian poetry, if I were really doing what I wanted to do, I would also be including Russian poetry in here. I think there are incredibly interesting political things going on in poetry, generally, but especially by women. I mm -hmm. mean, Fanailova, Maria Stepanova, mm -hmm. um, Polina Varskova. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's an area of culture that is really exciting for women's empowerment. And, you know, journalism. Who are the most amazing... Um, well, let's not remember Polikovska, but um, anyway. I, I, whatever, I don't want to think about that. But, you know, major figures. Major figures in, 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 politi in culture, and sure. That, wouldn't that be a great way to counterbalance the stuff that you're studying? Yeah. I absolutely don't want to cut our really interesting conversation short, but instead I would like us to move this conversation into uh, to the reception room where the drinks and appetizers, refreshments are going to be served. Uh, so please join us for the, for the reception in the Grey Lounge. But meanwhile, thank you so much for your participation, for your presentations, for your endurance, for attendance. Uh, I believe it was an exceptionally productive day and a half and also very uh, enjoyable despite, despite the difficulty of the topic. Mm -hmm. so thank, thank you thank so much. You very much.